I definitely agree with agree with Jay Connor that the money always comes first. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Well, my guest today on raising private money has raised several million dollars in private money for his own business. And in addition to that, he has raised over $300 million for his clients. In addition, what my guest does is he helps real estate entrepreneurs to scale their portfolios by attracting and showing them how to attract private lenders and investors and their capital instead of chasing after it. Just like me, it's all about attracting and no chasing. Well, he created what's called the money partner formula process that raises six figures or more in six weeks or less by getting the right private lenders and investors to come to you. Well, he's the CEO and founder of Results Enterprises Incorporated, the money partner formula, which offers a proven strategy to help his clients find their ideal investors and quickly raise the capital they need to grow their real estate portfolios like super, super fast. When he started investing in the very same year that I did back in 2003, he's been helping thousands of real estate entrepreneurs from around the world. And he's been featured on some of the largest real estate shows on the internet. He shared the stage with big names like Robert Kiyosaki and George Foreman, Ted Thomas, and Brian Tracy, just to name a few. The Money Partner Formula team does only one thing, and that is helps real estate investors raise capital. You're going to meet my friend and my guest, Dave DeBow, right after this. Like you, Dave, uh, you know, I started full time in investing in real estate back in 2003. My first six years, I relied on the local banks, mortgage companies to fund my deals. And then I lost my lines of credit and learned about private money. That's how I got sort of moved into private money. Did you start out using private money in 2003 or did you have something happen in your business? How did you get started in private money? Jay, I was not as smart as you are back in 2003. So I saw one of those late night infomercials. You remember those? Oh, you yes. too. You too can get rich in real estate with little or no money down. And in 2003, Jay, that's exactly what I had. <laughs> little or better said, no money for down payments. Uh, it was kind of funny. I'd, I'd been living overseas for over a dozen years in Latin America, had a business, had a family, the whole bit down there. And then I moved everybody back to Canada. So I went from Costa Rica to the frozen hinterlands of Canada and had to start all over again from scratch. So that's when I got into real estate, low money, no money down type deals, doing creative uh, real estate investing. And that's what I did for several years. Then I kind of took a little bit of a break from active real estate investing joined forces with an up and coming real estate guru up here, helped him market his companies, grow them, and didn't get right back into it about until about 2010. And that's when I started, you know, looking at raising capital. So it, it was a it was a rocky road to get started with Jay. I understand. Now you mentioned creative deals. I never heard of subject to uh, buying a house subject to the existing note or seller financing or anything like that. Actually until 2009, when I actually started learning about private money myself. So what are the, what are the big benefits in your experience and opinion, Dave, in using private money versus just, you know, using the local bank or other funding sources or maybe even hard money lenders? Well, quite often we use both actually, Jay. So when, when we're talking about private money, quite often, 
for me in, in my situation, when I first got started with this, it wasn't so much to finance the whole property. It was to come up for the with the money and the credit to to put in the down payment, the closing costs, the property transfer taxes, any renovations, that kind of stuff. So the the actual cash involved to do the deal. So uh, that's kind of kind of how we were looking at it was how to raise that money for the down payment, and then we would be able to get more traditional financing for 70, 80 percent of the value of the property from the bank. So that's that's how I got started with that. And I would bring on what we would call joint venture partners. So they would actually bring the money to the table for the down payment, et cetera. And they would also bring their credit to the table so we could qualify for that traditional, uh, typically cheaper kind of financing through the banks. And together we would do the deal. I'd, I'd bring the deal to the table. I'd bring the, the skill set. I would bring the power team. They'd bring the money. They'd bring the credit. And we'd share the profits. Well, so what you're doing is you're doing a combination of like three different kinds or two or three different kinds of funding to uh, for that one deal to happen. Traditional, more traditional lending or maybe hard money lending, hard money broker, combined private monies. And of course, you and I understand the same definition of a private lender. That's an individual. <laughs> like a human being that is coming to the table, even uh, either as a joint venture partner or is coming as a, a private lender. So, um, so that's interesting how you, you bring all that together. So when you're doing these types of deals with private lenders, yep. do you feel like that puts a real estate investor more in control of their, of their destiny and their business? Oh, hey, man, you and I are drinking from the same Kool-Aid there. That's for sure. So, yeah, that's that's what it's all about, Jay. I mean, there's just, as I learned early on, there's only so much you can do under your own financial steam. Sooner or later, bam, you hit that wall. You run out of cash. You run out of credit. So you got two choices there. You can stay stuck. You can wait years and years and years to save up the money and the credit for the next deal. Or you can take the shortcut, and that is, finding private lenders like like you teach people so well how to do. Yeah. Um, you know, one question that I get every now and then from some people, particularly students that might be attending an event or whatever, they'll say, Jay, I'm confused on something. They'll say, I understand using private money when you're like starting out and you're short on cash yourself. But Jay, you've made a lot of money in real estate. Why are you still using private lenders? Why are you not using your own cash for your deals? And so if you were asked that question, Dave, which you probably have been asked that question before, what would your answer be? Well, the first answer to be is I'm not as rich as Jay Connor. So, you know, <laughs> the pockets might not be as deep, but bottom line, it's, it's like, you know, you're Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump is a billionaire. Mr. Trump still raises tons of money for his real estate deals when he was actively doing deals. It's the same idea. It's it's massive, massive leverage. Plus, it really, it does two things in my mind. And let me know if you agree with this, Jake. By bringing on private lenders, it allows you to scale faster, go bigger, do bigger deals. Most people do run out of cash and credit to, to scale up eventually. But even if you do have the cash and credit, by bringing on private lenders, you're able to do a larger volume of deals, start getting into different kinds of deals, bigger deals, different markets, and you're able to lower your risk. And at the same time, you're able to share the wealth with other people, right? Because I don't know about you, Jay, but quite often my experience has been a lot of the private lenders that we're working with cannot or will not do the kind of real estate deals we're doing on their own. They either don't have the interest. They don't have the time. They don't have the knowledge. Whatever it is, we're bringing something to the table that is extremely valuable for them. So it really is kind of a win-win situation all around. Well, and I, you know, <clears throat> I agree a hundred percent because uh, my answer is pretty much exactly what you just said, and that is, I don't want my own personal money buried in twenty-five projects that I've got going on. You mm -hmm. know. 
my cash is going to run out sooner or later if I keep adding on more projects and more projects. But with private money, as you said, the money never runs out. There's no limit to the number of private lenders we can have doing business with us. There's no, no limit to the amount of private money that we can be using. And, you know, I, I, if somebody's going to do a flip and all they're going to do is one flip and they've got the cash and you're going to be in and out in six or nine months, then that's not a bad use of your money. But if you're going to scale your business, you're going to need to be using private money and investors and et cetera, like we're talking about. So one thing you talk about, Dave, is you talk about having a way, the money partner formula, I believe is what you call it. And you talk about a way that there really is a very realistic way for someone that's perhaps never raised or attracted private money uh, to get six figures in six weeks. So can you give us the 30,000 foot view of what that looks like? For sure. It's going to be more like a 60,000 foot view, Jay, but that's okay. So bottom line is I firmly believe that all of us have somewhere between one and $3 million worth of capital available to us within our existing network of contacts. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about your friends, your family members, your coworkers, your business associates, people you know from church or civic organizations, Rotary, Lions, whatever that is, or, or people you know from your sports clubs. You've got that pre-existing relationship with these folks, people you know from RIAs, right? They know you, you know them. That is the fastest, easiest, and safest route to the capital that I'm aware of. So the first thing is a part of this whole money partner formula. It's pretty simple. We got three phases and three steps per phase. So the first phase is what we call the foundation. And that is let's create a target group of these ideal investors, people we already have that pre-existing relationship with. And let's focus all of our energy on them first, because that's where the easy money is. So that's the first part. Second part, let's create a way to communicate with them. We do that with having an online presence, a, a website, an investor-focused website. Third thing is, let's make sure we got something intelligent to show them. When, some, when somebody puts up their hand and says, hey, I'm interested in your deals, you need to be able to walk them through a simple explanation of how you work. So I know, Jay, you're, you're a master at this, at creating pitch decks. We call ours our million-dollar investor presentation. Same idea. So that's the foundation. We need those three pieces in place. After that, we've got the launch phase. That's the time to get the ball rolling. And it's really important. The first part of the launch phase is what we call the warm up campaign. And that is instead of charging in like a bull in a china shop, like dumb, dumb Dave did back in the day, where I said, Hey, it's Dave. I got deals. Have you got dough? And all I succeeded in was turning off a lot of people. What we want to do instead, Jay, is we want to reconnect with people on that list first on more of a personal level and then set the stage for that real estate conversation, that investing conversation. So we call this the warm-up campaign. There's a way we can automate that. It's just three simple little emails that go out like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, ding, ding, ding. That does all the heavy lifting for you. All right, so we've got that. That's the first part of our launch phase. Second part is we want to get a bunch of practice runs with our spanky new investor presentation under our belt. So we've got what I call my ninja uh, our meeting strategy. And this is a way for you to get 15 to 20 meetings booked, uh, lickety split, like get those all done within a week or two and get that first six figures of capital really rolling that way. And at the same time, as part of this whole launch, we're going to start the marketing. And I call this constant, consistent, edutaining communication. And uh, Mr. Jay Connor is an absolute master of that. And the goal of this whole marketing thing is for that to do the heavy lifting for us, right? So the goal of the marketing is to create curiosity, to show people that we're active, get them interested in what we're doing. We're not trying to sell specific deals. We're just trying to get them to put up their hand and say, hey, I'm interested, tell me more. So that's the launch phase. We've got the, the warming people up. We've got the booking a whole bunch of meetings right off the get-go. And then also starting that constant, consistent, edutaining communication. And then the final phase is what I call the leverage phase. And when we're doing that, we are starting off by going, instead of just doing one-on-one presentations, let's start leveraging that, doing group presentations via webinars. So doing a webinar every three or four months that we promote to our entire list. And instead of doing onesie twosies, we're getting 10, 15, 
20 people on the call at the same time and doing a group presentation. And then it's keeping the ball rolling with the marketing, keeping that marketing going out there because it's pretty simple to raise six figures fairly quickly, but the lion's share of the capital that's available to you is going to come to you over time. So we want to make sure that we're staying top of mind, front and center with our investor prospects. And then last but not least is what I call capital credibility. We want to be seen as an authority, as an expert in the eyes of our prospective investors, right? Because Jay, I think I've heard you say this, in order for somebody, a private lender to loan you their money, they need to know you, they need to like you, and they need to trust you with that money that they're lending you. So that's uh, that credibility is all about creating that trust. What I love about your way that you approach this is that it is step by step. And, you know, particularly someone that's never attracted or raised private money, that's what that's what they want. That's what we want. We want, what do I do first? What do I do second? What do I do third? Another thing that I love about your process, just like mine, is we totally separate the conversation of teaching somebody in your warm market what private money is, teaching them our program, how does it work, and we separate having a deal for them to fund. One of the biggest mistakes real estate investors make, including myself when I started out, Me was too. talking about my private lending program and talking about a deal. And Dave, you and I've talked about this before. The worst time to be raising private money is when you got a deal that needs funding, right? And I love it how you, just like myself, you separate the conversation of, okay, here's the program. They tell us they're in. Here's how much they got to work with. Do they need to be introduced to my self-directed IRA company that I recommend if they've got retirement funds? So that's why I practice just like you and preach. The money comes first. That's right. right. The chicken, <laughs> chicken and the egg, right? And we both learned that the hard way. I remember, you know, I lost a deal because even though it was a really good deal, I was scrambling. I had this deal on the go. I hadn't done any of this stuff. That's that's why I came up with the process. And bottom line was, it doesn't matter how good the deal is. If you desperately need that money, that desperation oozes out of every pore in your body and it repels the other person. It creeps them out. It's it's like a, a gentleman I, I follow. He, he says, needy is creepy. And it <laughs> definitely is. <right? laughs> so, That's a writer or downer right there. Needy is creepy. Needy is creepy. Yes. Well, another thing that you just said, um, what you said in essence was, it's going to be easy to attract and raise a few hundred thousand dollars, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. Um, but you know, getting into the millions, which I recommend people get because a few hundred thousand dollars, particularly if you're in California, you might do one deal <laughs> you know, in California. And, and most, most of us in Canada, it's about the same thing. Yeah. Prices are crazy. And so what you just said a few minutes ago was most of the money you're going to attract and raise is going to come over time. And that's exactly what I say all the time. The money is in the follow-up. Mm. The money's in the follow-up. And you probably, like I, have actually got a automated follow-up system that keeps nurturing those potential private lenders, right? We do. And I call that that constant, consistent, edutaining communication. Because I really want to know your opinion about this, Jay. So, you know, I see so many people... When it comes to their marketing, it's like they're pitching deals and they're sending out spreadsheets and it's charts and graphs and numbers and all this kind of stuff. And they only communicate with their list when they got a deal on the go. And then other than that, it's like crickets. Right? It's like one of those old Westerns with the tumbleweeds going down the street kind of thing. Big mistake. You need to keep on top of mind with your prospective investors because here's my philosophy. If somebody's going to invest a hundred grand with you, they need to know that you're a reliable person they can count on. That that's pretty top and center. So if all they're hearing from you is this sporadic communication every time you need money, that's not going to position you very well. On the other hand, if every single week at least 
you're you're showing up in their inbox and their email with something that's a little bit educational, not overboard, a little bit educational, hopefully a little bit entertaining. Maybe not as entertaining as you and your lovely wife singing and, and playing the piano. I love that, Jay. But, you know, that idea, injecting some personality into the whole thing. It's not just dry. It's not just real estate. Because at the end of the day, Jay, I think, yeah, I think you and I talked about this. At the end of the day, really, here's, here's what your private lender is investing in. They're investing in you. They really are. They're investing in you. The deal is just the security for that investment. Let me know what your thoughts are on that, Jay. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I uh, at my events, I will have a dozen or so of our private lenders come and I'll bring them up on stage and I'll interview them. And I will ask them, one of the questions I ask them is, how important is that mortgage or deed of trust that collateralizes, you know, the deal? And they say it is important. That is important. But they invariably all the time say, What's most important is I trust you, yeah. right? I trust you. And so regardless of the security uh, and how collateralized that note is, no one's going to invest with you, in, at least in my experience and opinion, unless that trust factor. I say all the time, this world of private money, uh, there's a five-letter word that begins with a great big capital T that really, really plays into the success of this. I'm really curious, Dave, how important do you think mindset, <coughs> excuse me, how important do you think a person's mindset is, <coughs> excuse me, in attracting money? And if it is, what kind of mindset do they need? Well, you know, Jade, mindset is everything. And, and the kind of mindset I think people need to have is, well, they got to have a few different mindsets. So one mindset is, they should be open to trying something different than they've done before. So if you don't have any experience working with private lenders, if you haven't done this before, it's going to be a new thing. It's going to require you doing different things than you've done in the past. And then the other mindset I think we really, really need to keep top is that it's got to be a win-win. Like we have to be legitimately looking out for our investor partners. We have to put their interests ahead of ours, or at least at the same level as ours. That's the only way you can have true long-term success. And, I, you know, I, I don't want to go all biblical on people and all that kind of thing, but it really is. It, it's all about, you know, treating other people as you would like to be treated. So respecting the fact that they have worked long and hard to save up or create this money that they're investing with you in your deals, you need to be a good steward of that money. So the mindset you need to have is that. The other thing is that, you know, I, I talk a lot about working with friends and family members to get started. So sometimes people get, get going with that, but they're very loosey goosey about it. So they go in with a spit and a handshake, and that's a big mistake for, for lots of reasons, right? But bottom line is here's the best recommendation I have for you. Even if you're working with your mom, your adult child, your best friend from high school, you're working with somebody you know very, very well as a joint venture partner, as an investor, work with them as if they were a complete stranger. Do the deal with them as if they were an accredited investor. So if you were working with an accredited investor, they would, number one, want to make sure that they've got independent legal advice about the deal. Number two, they want to make sure that you've got the right paperwork set up and their lawyers checking that over. Number three, they want to make sure that you've got, you know, very clear reporting that they're reporting to them on a whatever that looks like, quarterly, semi-annual, annual basis, whatever that you, you've agreed upon. Number four, they're going to want to make sure that, you know, they've got clarity on how they're getting paid, what that looks like. So if you're sharing cash flow on a deal, how are you paying them? Is it going to be every month automatically deposited in their account? Is it going to be quarterly? Is it going to be annually? And make sure you do it. So you need to, even if you're working with a, a friend or a family member, be professional about it. And that's going to set you in really good stead for working more with more investors moving ahead. I'm so glad you said that, Dave, because for that very reason, I always invite my mother, my 88-year-old mother, who looks mighty good in her Corvette, I might say. <laughs> <clears throat> 
But I always, my mother's one of my private lenders. Yeah. And I always invite her to my private money events for this one reason. And that is to make the point that you just made. And that is, even though she's my mother, she gets the same security. She gets the same protection as any other of our private lenders. For example, on every note that we do, she still gets a deed of trust. Most people call it a mortgage, but here in North Carolina, it's a, it's a, a deed of trust. So she, we collateralize the note for her, just like any other private lender deal we do. She's named on the morg on the uh, insurance policy as the mortgagee, so she's protected there. That the one reason we do that is that in case we have any insurance filings uh, on that property. Well, the private lender's name is named on that check. They got to sign off on that check. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, another point you made, Dave, is that you've just got to be serving your private lenders. And, and, and what triggers in my mind when you said that was, you know, all these private lenders that we have, they never heard of private money before you taught them about right. it. Exactly. They never heard of self-directed IRAs. They are looking to us as the expert and, you know, telling them what the, telling them what you recommend they do. Like, for example, one really big moral obligation that I have, moral and ethical and ethical, is when I teach someone about self-directed IRAs and they, and they establish a self-directed IRA account at a third-party custodian. Well, that money's sitting there. They're not making any money until we put that money to work for them. So when I have a new private lender, particularly that has established a retirement account based on my recommendation, they're going to the top of the list <laughs> to to put that money to work. You agree with all that? Oh, for sure. Definitely. And it's all about setting realistic expectations. Uh, this is one of the mistakes I made early on in my capital raising career, Jay, was showing people my home run deals as case studies because I was so proud of these things, right? So I, I wanted to show them off. <clears throat> but then one of two things happened. Quite often, it would actually scare people off because the numbers were just outside of their comfort level, outside of their context, because all they'd done was invest in mutual funds at, you know, two or three percent a year. And here we're showing 23 percent annualized ROI and all this kind of stuff. And they can't get their heads around it. So they think, that's too good to be true. That Dubot guy must be full of it. Or perhaps even worse, that set up that level of expectation. And I'm showing them my home run deals. And then what's the chance I'm going to get a home run every time? Here's what the chance is. Zero. All right. Zero chance that's going to happen every single time. So hard earned experience nowadays, what I do and what I always encourage our clients to do is let's just show a plain vanilla type deal. You know, things that we can definitely attain. And then let's do our best to exceed that because then you're going to look like a rock star. Then you're going to look like a hero. Then they're going to reinvest with you. They're going to give you testimonials. They're going to give you referrals. It's just a beautiful way to do business. Another thing you said a couple of minutes ago, and I love it, <clears throat> was if the only time your investors and private lenders hear from you is when you need money, that's just sort of not like setting yourself up in a very good light. Case in point, just yesterday, yesterday, I personally took about two hours <clears throat> and I called a good number of our private lenders for just one reason. <clears throat> I called them up and I told them that I'm updating my private lender spreadsheet as to how much, how many funds or how much in funding they have available that they would like to invest and just want to update the sheet. So I wasn't asking for any money because I never ask for money anyway. But anyway, I wasn't asking for any money. I just want to update my private lender, you know, spreadsheet. And invariably, almost every one of them said, well, do you have a particular deal in mind right now? Is there a particular dollar amount that you're looking for on a deal right now? Sorry. And I said, no. Nope. No, no particular deal, no particular dollar amount. Just checking in with you to see how you're doing. And if you've got available funds that you want me to put to work for you as soon as I can, I'll let you know when I've got a deal. 
And uh, about 80% of them had more. <laughs> <laughs> well, here, here's what I love about what you just said there, Jay, because this is this is our goal for our clients. And you are in the perfect position. This like you're you're where everybody should be aspiring to be with their investors. And you've got what I call you've got your investor ducks in a row. You've got that core group of investors lined up, waiting in the wings to jump on your next deal. So unlike everybody else that's out there spamming their deals to everybody they know, you don't need to do that. You've already got, you know who your next investors for your next deal are already before you've got that deal. So it gets back to that, which comes first, the money or the deal? <laughs> the money comes first, right? And if you got, now you're, you've been doing this for years, you're at a, a much higher level than most people. But again, you guys, if you could have, depending on what kind of deals you're doing, if you can have two or three or four or five people lined up, and what I do, you've got a spreadsheet, that's smart, CRM, whatever it is. What I like to do, I'd love to know what you do there, Jay, is I love to get my investors to sign off on an expression of interest, right? It's not legally binding, but I tell you what, if somebody signs off on a document and says, you know, I, Joe Schmo, am ready, willing, and able to invest the sum of up to $100,000 with Mr. Jay Connor for a real estate deal sometime within the, the fiscal year of 2023, the chances of that, of Joe, Coming up with that hundred grand when you are looking for it, rise exponentially versus Joe just saying, "Hey Jay, yeah, I got a hundred grand. Let me know when you got a deal." Would you agree with that, Jay? I love it, and I love. I've, I've never heard the terminology "expression of interest," an expression of interest that's so soft, so um, not in your face, yeah. right? But it's still yet in writing a communication tool. It's sort of like, you know, on a real estate deal, a letter of intent. <laughs> it's exactly the same thing. Yeah, exactly the same thing. And here's the cool thing. We just, you know, with technology and the COVID and all this kind of stuff, nowadays, you can do this on a Zoom call, right? You can do <laughs> it. It's kind of low tech, but it works, man. Because here's the ideal thing. You, you actually want to get them to sign off on this thing. So it works really well if you're face to face with somebody. You can just whip one of these sheets out fill in the blanks for them, just have them sign it, you sign it, you know, you take a picture. You, you, it's not legally binding anyhow. You don't need the original. <clears throat> but what you can do is on Zoom, just share your screen, type in their stuff, fill it in there, and then they can sign it using their mouse. It's going to look like they're a three-year-old trying to print kind of thing, but that's okay. And it just, it, it just really indelibly kind of gets that done. So Take a screenshot of that. You send them a copy. You keep a copy. You're off to the races. I love it. Well, Dave, <clears throat> I, in the introduction, I talked about how you were the creator and founder of Money Partner Formula. And yes, there it is there right it behind is. you, Money Partner Formula. So I know people want to continue this conversation with you on raising private money and how you do it. So how can my listeners and audience uh, connect with you? Well, there's two ways, Jay. One is they can go to my website, which is moneypartnerformula.com. There they can poke around and check out everything that, that, that we're up to. And Jay, it, can I offer something a little bit different for your listeners? I just, I want to be respectful and, and make sure it's okay with you because. Sure. You've, I've been on your podcast. You've been on, I've got a couple of podcasts now because I'm a glutton for punishment. But one of my podcasts, I'm kind of switching gears. And instead of just in, uh, interviewing gurus, I really enjoy interviewing what I call everyday people who are investing in real estate. So would it be all right if I invited some of your, your viewers to be guests on my podcast? Jay, is that, do I have your permission? Sure. I'm, I'm sure they would be honored. Oh, I, I would love that because I know you've got movers and shakers who are who are doing stuff and I'd love to interview them. So if you're interested in that, you guys, you can go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. DaveInterviewsYou.com. You can check it out. You can apply. You can pick, pick a day at a time. And I'd love to have you on my show. That's wonderful. Dave, thank you so much for taking the time to join me here on the show. Thank you, Mr. Connor. Always a pleasure. All right, you got it. Well, there you have it. Another raising private money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I need your help.
I need your help in sharing this episode to your connections. So please share, subscribe. If you are listening on iTunes, be sure to follow the same on Spotify. And if you happen to be watching on YouTube, be sure and click that bell so you don't miss out on any of the upcoming amazing episodes of Raising Private Money. I'm wishing you all the best. Here's to taking your business to the next level by attracting a lot of private money. And I'll see you right here on the next episode of Raising Private Money. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconner.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconner.com slash money guide to get your free guide. We'll see you next time on Raising Private Money with Jay Conner.